Hi everybody, hope you're doing well today. Um, it's been a while since I've posted, but um, like many of you, I've been um, paying a lot of attention to you know to what's going on in the news, uh, especially when it comes to um, some of the things uh, going on down south uh, with the new Supreme Court appointment, um, etc. So. Um, I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring today about an, an interesting topic, um, one that's gaining quite a bit of of press these days, um, and the topic is privilege. Now it's interesting. We've talked about this this topic within the within the context of parenting and rights versus privilege. Um, so when we're when we as parents are are raising our children, um, there are certain things that we do for them. Um, and it's a right that they have um, to feed them, to clothe them, to, you know, to care for their safety, to structure their days, all sorts of things that we do as parents for our kids that, and one would say that that um, is a right that they have. Um, and then as our children grow, uh, those rights turn into privileges. Why? Because they are now capable of doing those things for themselves um, and cap more capable of making a contribution. So for instance, um, is your son or daughter's bedroom, is that their right to have that or is that a privilege? Well, if your son or daughter is capable of making some income and paying some rent, um, then, you know, uh, them not having to pay rent, for instance, and living in your home is a privilege. If they were paying rent, then they would be more like a tenant and they would have rights. Um, if they weren't able to generate income for some reason, maybe they had a disability or something else was going on, um, then, then you putting a roof over their head would not be a privilege, it would be a right. So that's something that we covered earlier from the parental direction, if you will. But I want to take on a whole different topic or maybe a different spin on it. Um, but the topic of privilege has come up, I guess you could say, almost in politics these days. Um, certainly when it comes to um, social issues uh, where people are now talking a lot about different um, groups in society having privilege over another group um, and maybe in fact if you're like me even the place that you work or or other other places that you go to you've heard workshops and presentations on the topic of privilege and um, i happen to just coming out come out of one of those workshops an entire day in which that topic was um, I guess you could say coupled with or, or partnered with the idea of inclusions. And so when we talk about inclusion, you know, that, that topic can be something applied to, to whether it's at the national level or whether it's uh, in, in our workplaces or what have you, uh, or just society at large in our communities. Um, we talk a lot about inclusion. We talk a lot about diversity. And with that also, we talk a lot about privilege. All three of those those topics are, are fairly prominent right now, and um, and I wanted to just again throw my hat in the ring a little bit regarding those topics, but I'm going to try to stay focused on the issue of privilege real quick because this is a, a quite a large discussion, and I'm still trying to get my head around it myself. Um, so one of the things that is tied to that topic. Um, and when we think about privileges or when, when it's being described to us in, in a guess, more contemporary idea, um, is that people have privileges that they don't know about, you know, and, and uh, unconscious privileges, subconscious privileges, um, things that, um, that were allowed or benefits that we have that we're not really aware of. 
and and you know I don't want to say too much in this particular video I want to give you something to think about because I've given it some thought uh, because it seems like the idea of privilege the way it's being presented in a political social kind of landscape is that somehow privilege is something that either somebody should be very careful about or somebody should feel ashamed of having um, and that somehow if someone is privileged it's yeah it's 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 a you know it's a bad thing um, you know because when one is privileged that means others are not privileged that other people are the term often used is marginalized um, so and I, and I and I'm gonna say all this but I also have posed to different people who present on this subject that I think there's a lot to be done yet in defining what the word privilege actually means but if we were to say that a privilege is is a, and I looked it up I looked it up on on you know in the in the dictionary looked at several different definitions of the word privilege and it's you know even those were a bit confusing sometimes because um, it seemed to you know to um, to suggest that a privilege was an advantage that somebody might have over somebody else a benefit that somebody might have over somebody else uh, or an allowance that somebody has and you know I'm, I'm okay I guess you could say with those definitions but it does it does you know kind of leave a lot of room for interpretation in terms of, of what a privilege is and I think it's really important that we define what a privilege is before we start you know talking about it um, but anyway let's go with the idea that a privilege is an, a, an allowance an advantage that somebody has and there seems like I said to be some movement in society right now to suggest that, that these privileges um, marginalize other people now I'm not sure whether that's a true way of presenting that but when I thought about this idea of privilege um, you know it, it it actually really intrigued me once because I was having a conversation with a friend who was talking about someone that they knew who felt that somehow they had a privilege because they were of a certain body type and so this person who was of this particular body type thought that maybe somehow because of their lack of awareness of the privilege that they have um, you know had maybe been um, insensitive to other people or what have you um, and, I, and I thought well that's an interesting way to look at it too isn't it I mean you know that that a person's body type can offer them privilege but then you know I guess in further thought it's like okay well you know we live in a society that and I think this has to be linked with privilege and maybe that's the only way privilege can exist and what do I mean by that because uh, it exists within a certain societal construct it's like it's like society the communities that we live in the nation that we live in decides what what it is that's privilege that gives privilege it places value so let's just say society places value on a certain body type that a person may have does that person then have privilege I guess one could say so but how is that any different than how it's been all over the globe since the beginning of time I mean society if you will uh, you know the world we live in the communities we live in the families that we live in uh, the systems that we live in I mean one could say just based on systems systems theory that a system needs certain things in order to survive and some of those things people possess maybe it's uh, certain you know skills and capacities etc and and so because of the skills and capacities one has 
one could say that one has privilege. If, if you have a skill or a capacity that I don't have, just by the very nature that you have it and I don't, does that, does that just make us different? And should we be appreciating those differences? Or does that make me marginalized? You know, that's where it starts to get confusing. So a family structure or a community or a nation or a world can, can based upon what it needs, uh, place value on certain attributes, certain things. Um, not everybody's going to have those attributes. Does that mean that those that don't are marginalized? That being said, uh, again, you know, it, it has everything to do with with what society or a particular group that you hang out with, what they consider, you know, uh, uh, valuable, what they've assigned value to would be one way to think about it. So it varies over time. So for instance, in this, in this example of, of body type being some sort of privilege, well, a hundred years ago, it was a different body type. And a hundred years before that, it was a different body type. And a thousand years before that, it was a different body type. And in different cultures, place different values on different body types or different physical attributes. So it seems to me that privilege, the idea of having a privilege has a lot to do with how society sees it, what value is placed on, it, on a particular thing. Um, and it also has to do with comparison, does it not? I mean, you know, how do I know whether I'm privileged or not? Well, I have to compare myself to somebody else. I have to compare myself to another community. I have to compare myself to another family. I have to compare myself to another person. How do I know if I'm privileged? So again, that, you know, that shifts significantly. I might compare myself, you know, to another person or what have you. This person has blue eyes. I have brown eyes. Um, in some societies, brown eyes might be more valued. In some societies, blue eyes might be more valuable, might, more, might be more valued. And because we're going to compare each other now, because I have brown eyes, is the blue eyed person marginalized? because we happen to live in a society that's placed value on brown eyes or vice versa. Now, one of the things that I, I had attached to this idea because we're focused on physical attribute is the idea of genetic privilege. Genetic privilege. I was, uh, like I mentioned, I was at a workshop and the presenter was asking us to make a list of where we felt privileged. And I still didn't quite understand the definition of privilege that we were trying to work from here. And we were doing it actually as a, as a as in, in partners. Um, and the partner that, that I had, um, my partner had written down things like, uh, you know, food, water, shelter, clean air. You know, there was quite a, a little bit of a list there. And, I, you know, the only thing I could think of in that moment was throwing a baseball. <laughs> Why would that be? Well, genetically speaking, for some reason, most of my life, I could throw a baseball farther and faster than probably any of my peers. So I became a baseball player. I became a pitcher. Um, I did pretty well in the sport. So because I somehow inherited that genetic code or what have you, the, the genetics for throwing a baseball fast, does that give me privilege? And is, is that something that I should be concerned with? And, you know, I mean, if we opened up that, that Pandora's box, if you will, everybody has different privileges at different times, you know, and, and if, and if there's such thing as, as, as society seems to be often saying at this point is that we need to be super self-conscious of the privileges that we have, then how many would there be? 
that's why I was blown away at the exercise that we were handed to do because depending on what, what one compares themselves to, um, that list of privileges could be huge. I mean, if I compare myself to, you know, in my economic circumstances to someone in a third world country, that list would be huge. Would it not? I mean, it, it would list everything. And that's just, that's just at the socioeconomic level. If I wanted to go into, into you know, genetic privilege, then that would be a whole other thing. It'd be another big list. And the other kind of uh, privilege I was thinking about is, I was going to say, inherited privilege. In other words, what if somebody uh, is you know, born, if you will, into a family that's well off or a family that is well educated or a family that, you know, that has a big family, um, that just by the virtue of being part of that family or that society, that you inherit certain privileges. You didn't work for them. It was just something that you inherited by being part of that particular group. Is that something we should be cautious of, careful of, uh, because, because we inherited a privilege that somehow now somebody else is marginalized. See, the idea that is being presented is that when people have these privileges, that somehow the person who's marginalized should be assisted in gaining access to the same privilege. But here's, here's another one that, that is challenging. What about earned privilege? Remember, I was telling you about the person who thought that, you know, they should be more conscientious or what have you, more aware about their, the privilege afforded by their physical body. Well, this particular person, one could say, worked hard to, to get that body in good shape. Is that a privilege? So if, you, if you've worked hard to get, you, get an education, if you've worked hard to buy a home, if you've worked hard to have an, uh, a vehicle, if you've worked hard to be get freedoms, you know, in, in as, a, as an employee, if you've worked hard to get a promotion, if you've worked hard, you know, as a mother or a father, you know, and have raised your children um, or have children, you know, the things that you've worked hard for, there was opportunities that you have now that have given you some freedom. See, now th that's another way to begin to, to look at that is, you know, okay, what is, if you earn a privilege that gives you freedom, is it really an allowance? You know, is it an advantage? Well, certainly one could say having freedom provides advantage. But is it a freedom or is it a privilege? You know, it's kind of like the national level. We, you know, and and if you will, at a philosophical level or or you know, ideological level, uh, freedom isn't free. So if we enjoy, if one could say, the privilege of freedom, it's because it was earned. And so, would it not be right for others who want that freedom to put in the work? for that freedom. And just because somebody has worked hard, like either a person or a community or a country has worked hard to become free, has made many, many sacrifices, which in previous videos, that's what we would call true entitlement. False entitlement is based upon an untrue sacrifice and true entitlement is based upon a true sacrifice. You know, it, it, it comes through sacrifice. So if you've sacrificed much of your time, energy, money in order to gain a particular thing, you know, like I said, an education, you know, a vehicle, a nice home, what have you, or a particular body that may be in shape. Is that a privilege? And because you have worked hard to to reach that that opportunity doesn't by its very nature marginalize other people 
And should then there be a responsibility on your part or the community's part to help those people access what you have? I think at the end of the day, how I, you know, where I'm at with this all right now is in two places. One is that privilege, if you will, whatever you want to call it, privilege, opportunity, freedom. I mean, you know, people come to our world and our country for opportunity. Opportunity to do what? To become free. You know, I'm not sure that there's anything wrong with that. But anyway, just to say that it seems to be part and parcel of all societies, no matter where, that there is, uh, that there is by our very nature, whether it's genetics, whether it's inheritance, whether it's earned, whatever it is, there's always, I guess you could say some that have some I hate to use the word privilege because it's got such a negative connotation right now, but there will always be people who have certain capacities and skills, certain talents, certain abilities that give them the opportunity to do things that, that other people can't do. I don't think that's wrong. That's just life. And when I, when I've looked deeper into this idea of privilege, as I said, is that depending on what I compare myself to, that's a thing. Depending on what I compare myself to as I sit here right now, if I compare myself to somebody on the right, hey, I'm, I'm privileged all over the place. If I pair, compared myself to somebody on the left, I'm marginalized. Why? Because I don't have what they have. Right? I mean, that's, that's what the whole idea is, is that some... The haves and the have-nots. I don't see that. I don't see that as any different, any different an issue than we've wrestled with. I guess you could say since the beginning of time. I think what people are trying to get at, which we get at all the time, if you come to the presentations that I do and the workshops and the groups and 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 listen to the videos and what i'm what i'm sharing with people is the idea of untrue entitlement you know if you have the privilege if you want to call it that if you have the privilege of having a home if you have the privilege of driving a car if you have the privilege of you know being in a wonderful relationship i guess you, that could be a privilege too if you have the privilege of money if you have the privilege of an education if you we have the privilege of clean air and water i don't think there's anything wrong with that i think the real question is is how do we use that privilege we can use it to just to our own advantage and be selfish or we can use our privileges, if you want to call that, our skills and abilities and capacities to help other people. You know, I, I think that this, this conversation going on about privilege and inclusion and all this kind of stuff right now is really many times quite confusing. And I, I think the confusion comes out of what I believe is an immature approach to it. Because, because the language that's being used and the approach being taken is often very divisive. As I said, it's, you know, it's the haves and have nots. It's the privileged and the marginalized. You know, um, it's, it's those that feel included and those that feel excluded. You know, it, it's interesting that um, in in the um, workshop that I went to, a concept, I'll give it a different name, but the concept, a concept was introduced that I could call a radical, radical inclusion or radical diversity. And I'll just, I, I'll just use those two uh 
topics, those two labels kind of interchangeably right now, because like I said, this is a huge, huge topic and something that really needs to be thought about. But if you're a parent out there, your child, your children are being bombarded by this language. They're being bombarded by these concepts um, in social media, television, um, and, and even at school. And so we need to be able to have these discussions with our kids. But so this, this person was talking about, this presenter was talking about this kind of radical inclusion, radical diversity. In other words, it's, you know, breaking down all the barriers and allowing people to be themselves, um, you know, and creating welcoming spaces for everybody to be themselves. And, and um, but the presenter did say that, you know, keep in mind, this is a, this is a dangerous or can be a dangerous exercise, if you will, a dangerous path. Um, now the presenter didn't say what the danger was, but as I thought about this, you know, and I, this is not an old, or this is not a new concept, but I want you to think about it, and I think we need to think about it at a practical level. You know, if there were radical inclusion in other words, just accept people for who they are and, you know, and everybody wants to be, there's this kind of push right now to be true to yourself. Now I say that and I want you to stay with me here and think about it because let me ask you guys, how many of you even knew who you truly were when you were a child, when you were a teenager? I mean, to truly know oneself is nothing short of a lifelong journey. It is not easy to know who one truly is. And so what you end up with is this kind of, this kind of premature um, pursuit of, of, being true to oneself, but people don't know what it means to be true to oneself at a particular time. The human mind and the human heart and all that is so, so complex that we can be, you know, we can easily fool ourselves or we can be easily deceived in terms of what is, who we truly are. And to me, that speaks a little bit into the danger of what this presenter said was there, but didn't explain. Now, practically speaking, you know, um, and I was talking to one of my colleagues about this, another counselor, and we're saying, you know, I was saying, you know, it used to be like the definition of insanity or a definition of insanity was was measured, you know, that insanity was measured to the degree that somebody could function in a healthy way within the society to which they belonged. You know, when, when people get disconnected from their society and from what it takes to function in a healthy way in that society, we tend, you know, to call that um, psychosis, that a person gets so, you know, kind of into their own ideas and own kind of fantasy and illusions about, you know, about how they think society should work or their own inner world and how it works. And there's such a disparity between that and how it really is that the person has lost contact with reality. And so let me give you a practical example, and this isn't an example indicative of, of, of um, psychosis, but every day I work with families. You guys know that, I've mentioned that. And oftentimes, you know, I will run into a, a teenager who um, has some ideas about what they think 
the world should be and how the world should function and how they want to be in it. And so, for instance, you know, a youth may not want to attend school. And this youth will give a number of different reasons why they think school's foolish, why they think they don't need school. On top of that, you know, because because essentially school and the idea of going to school just isn't consistent with who they truly are. They don't need school. They don't see school as valuable. Um, this may be a youth who, um, you know, for instance, wants to smoke marijuana on a daily basis. They don't think it's a bad thing. They want to do what they want to do. They they want to, uh, um, you know, watch a video game or play video games through the day or be on their cell phones and social media, you know, all hours of the day and night. They, um, um, sleep in until two or three or four in the afternoon, stay out until, you know, three or four at night. They probably don't have that good of a diet. They don't get any exercise. And this is who the person thinks they are. You know, that school isn't for them. And you know, when we look at that kind of stuff, we can we can say to ourselves, well, I think this person has lost it. This person's, you know, not, you know, all there. There's not quite, quite seeing it all. But from this person's perspective, you know, they feel marginalized because the rest of society is saying, well, you know, it'd be good for you to go to school be good for you to take a shower, comb your hair, maybe not smoke so much dope, um, think about getting a job, these kinds of things. But to the person, you know, to the teen, they're saying, well, this isn't the real, I mean, that world out there doesn't, doesn't allow me to be myself. So my question is, is where's the line between between inclusion, diversity, if you will, privilege, and and insanity and I think that was the danger that this presenter talked about but didn't explain see this idea of privilege and inclusion etc can when taken hostage if you will by the immature mind becomes insane and divisive And so we really need to take a close look at what we're talking about when we talk about these things like privilege and inclusion and diversity. And so again, I, you know, these are just a few thoughts that I'm having as I'm trying to study this and break it down and apply some of these ideas and, and kind of see what, you know, how they can be applied, what the, what the, um, usefulness of, of this is um, and also be discerning to know the difference between what's healthy and what is insane. So I'm going to leave that here with you right now. I'd like to do some follow-up videos on uh, a little bit more on inclusion and diversity um, here soon. So thank you for listening and um, yeah, you know, it's just some real interesting times that we live in. Um, but we've got to be able to give this some thought and to help our kids through it. So have a good day.